Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. As I'm sure you're aware by now, we're working with our partners Kia UK this summer. You may know that Kia have been embedded in the world of cricket for almost 15 years. Kia have actively supported the rise in women's cricket since 2014 and have been the proud sponsors of Surrey County Cricket Club for the last decade. During each episode of the podcast, Kia will provide you with an opportunity to get closer to the action through their Kia's movement that inspires moment. These include tickets and experiences to key cricket competitions across the summer. Listen out each week to hear how you can get involved and win the opportunity of a lifetime. Ugh. Australia have retained the ashes after it rained for two days in Manchester. I'm Yazrana and mourning with me on this appropriately miserable grey London day is Phil Walker, Ben Gardner and Will McPherson Morning, yes. from The Telegraph. Phil, how are you feeling? Um, are you okay? I'm asking because I'm not sure if I'm okay. Yeah, I feel I feel good. I think the, the title race is still on. I think Essex are on the coattails of Surrey and another win. I think that's four on the spin now. So it's all on. It's all on. Um, I feel fucking terrible. That's the truth of it. Uh, and it's not to do with uh, nationalism, jingoism, any of that nonsense. I don't really mind. I just want to see a fair fight. I just want to see a fight to, to the end. That's all. Um, all... All our hopes and dreams, regardless of wherever you happen to land on the sort of hoary old nonsense of allegiances, was building to this week here. You walk through the doors here at the Oval and the the paraphernalia of a test match is just getting going. The mechanics of a test match, you can see it, the trucks are in, the green team are already getting their, their coats. So it's all fe- feeling like it's building to Thursday and it will be a peculiar and uh, unshakably flat occasion um, and it's not, it's not for any other reason other than it pissed down. And yesterday, I, yeah, look, firstly, I'm lucky, right? I'm sitting here. I had a nice night's sleep. I went to the pictures last night. Um, you three were all up there. So I can't really moan because you've lived it more intently and more grimly than I have. Uh, but nonetheless, yesterday was as painful a day. And you can ask, ask my wife. I mean, I am susceptible to the odd grumpy Sunday afternoon, <laughs> right? But yesterday was, was bleak. I sat in the garden um, drinking uh, <laughs> and, and re- re- reading a sort of especially misanthropic novel uh, that I'd selected, especially for the occasion. <laughs> Left my phone indoors. After I'd seen Andrew Miller's weather map, that was me done. Left my phone indoors, read the, read the novel, drank... Um, Chapel down, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. What a drop. Yeah, fabulous. It really just get better and better and better. <laughs> uh, it's a marvellous aftertaste. Um, and then uh, I went to the pictures on my own, went to see Oppenheimer on my own and sat between two miserable bastards watching Oppenheimer, one of whom wouldn't move when I tried to get along the line. He was clearly a cr- cricket fan in mourning as well, so he just wouldn't move his legs. So I just stood on his foot and we sat next to each other watching the destroyer of worlds for the next three and a half hours. Um, I thought it was going to lighten the load, lighten the mood, or maybe even put things in perspective, but it didn't. It just sort of deepened things Mm. for me. Um, I thought it might offer a degree of distance uh, from our our own unique pain, but no, it hasn't. Uh, And and I'm not not hamming this up. Yesterday was awful, and I can only imagine what it was like to actually be there. I got a message from a friend yesterday morning at 10.44 a.m. and he said, this is actually the most frustrating sporting moment I can ever remember. Is I've, this a new fan? Or is not, not, not really. Okay. Um, I've, I've never been so excited by a sporting situation and great things being so close, yet some bollocks is stopping it from happening. And I, I actually woke up feeling worse today than I went to bed yesterday. And I think part of it, is even though that we all work in cricket, right, we're surrounded by people who like cricket. But this is comparable to England losing a World Cup semi-final on penalties. But you can't share this with with the masses. There's that sadness. But I'm more sad about it, us not getting the finale here. Yeah, you're everything, right. everything has been building up. It was almost written in the stars after Lords that England would come back in this series. That's why we felt we are talking about feeling betrayed during the run chase at Headingley because this isn't supposed to happen. One, this wasn't supposed to happen. The one slight happen. difference, though, is that when the England football team lose, lose a big game, great cities of England are raised to the ground, uh, <laughs> whereas here people just sort of traipse back on the tram. And, <laughs> and that's, that's their own protest. That's their own signature of pain. 
Yeah, it's mm. also normally to someone like Croatia rather than actual Australia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never lost a penalty shootout to Australia. One day it will be Australia. It will, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you you followed the England team very closely over a really long time. Uh, how do you feel? Yeah, I, I'm I'm flat for the same reason actually. The the, the, the sense of destiny uh, that this the game here at my favourite ground um, isn't going to get the finish it deserves, and also like the question of will that ever happen? Mm. Will we ever get a live, properly, full-on, 2-2 live final Ashes test where, after the end of a great series, obviously 2009 was the last decider, but that was a bit of a strange old series, 2009, wasn't it? And it just felt so perfectly written, 2-0 up, 2 all. England and, and, and the fact that England did everything they possibly could and were in total control of that mm. game. Um there's going to be a bit of whys and wherefores about how they went about this game. Um, I don't. I honestly don't think they could have done much more in the um, number of overs we were. The game was given, which is essential. It did essentially amount to three days cricket because of some pretty slow cricket on days one and uh, two, and then the crazy rain situation towards the end of the match. So it's, this, it's a nine session match mm. on a really quite flat. It's a you know Zach Crawley sort of that Crawley one eight nine pitch, and they couldn't force a result. I mean, it's hard to be angry about that, isn't it? Mm. It's uh, also like the fact that it's this group of players as well, like this, you know, when you go through their ages, like uh, Root, Bairstow, uh, Wood, Wokes, Stokes, obviously Anderson and Broad. Uh, will any of those guys be here at the 2027 Ashes? Some, maybe some of them are pushed, but not, yeah. not not all of them, not not the majority of them. And also just how it felt like so much just was building just from the start of, you know, of last summer to this. And, and actually, you know, Baz Ball or Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum, this, as much as, you know, they might still be around for a bit longer, this was the biggest moment. This, you know, bigger than, you know, India next year, even if somehow they're still clinging on at 25, 26, this at home, who just felt, felt important as well. And, and now, now it's gone. And I, it, I mean, I think it, it would have been easier to take if this whole week had gone and there'd been no rain and even Australia had, had smashed in the way they'd be like, okay, fair enough, better cricket team. But England... And like this will sound like winning, but I think it is just true that England have at this point played the better cricket in this series. I mean, you've had three games where broadly level, even if you give Australia 55%, 45% across those three games, and in this game, England smashed it. And that's the weirdness of cricket, but it's also just, you know, the thing to say that England have played the better cricket and can't now at this point win the series. And it, it like there's, there's, there's no ashes decider at the over. I actually I genuinely think that the, the, it's a decider on on the kind of who has actually played better in this series mm, this yeah. week I think at the moment you like it's kind of you know, maybe England winning on points if we're talking boxing mm. wise but if England turn up here and play like they did at Old Trafford and get the result they deserved at Old Trafford then I think they have been the better team in the series mm. equally if Australia turn up and um, win 3-1 then it goes that way as well yeah. like it, 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 there's, there's nothing on it in a way, and there's loads on it in other ways. There, there's a lot. There's a lot of chat saying that our oh, rain in the UK is just part of cricket. That is true, but so is moaning about the rain. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're allowed to moan about the rain. And there's been a lot of chat in Australia overnight about how Australia deserved to retain the series because they won the first two tests. And I just don't really buy that. There have been four tests, and Australia were better in two. They played to England's ego and won. But in the last two, England have made personnel changes. Lions been out. Australia haven't managed that well, and England have been more measured. You know. England's sloppiness and maybe overconfidence meant they were always vulnerable to this pol possibility of, of rain intervening. But on the balance of play, it just should be two all. Australia did well to win those two games. But, um, you know, if, if they win a third test match, it's an amazing tour and that's still up for grabs. But at the, at the moment, it, do, it does just feel crap that we don't get the, the finale. Um, they've, they've won enough key moments to be level in the series and with a bit of luck. they hmm. They don't not deserve to be in this position, I don't think. Th they've not had the best of the conditions, obviously, aside from the last <laughs> yeah. two days. That goes without saying. But, you know, they, they've lost four tosses in a row. They were up against it at certain moments uh, in the first three games. Hmm. Um, I thought they, you know, the nerve that they showed on the final day at Edgbaston can't be discounted. England were probably up in that, in that uh, battle, in that run chase for most of it. Um, you win series in moments, really. We'll mention the 09 series. I think Australia made 10 hundreds and England made two across that whole series. Australia made more runs and took loads more wickets, yet England won the big moments. Um, and so 
you know, look in the book, I, I mm. guess. Uh, we, we can argue until the cows come home about whether this is a fair reflection of the four test matches. And I think everybody would probably agree that 2-2 two, two is, is reasonable. Um, I don't want this little segment to be misconstrued, though, as, mm. you know, whinging poms, sour grapes, because it's not. I just think everybody who loves the game deep down, whatever side of the fence you're on, they just wanted to see the finale that the quality and the drama uh, deserves. And we've been robbed of that through no fault of anybody other than the gods. Yeah, and the, the kind of uh, Australians will take the piss out of this because of England's kind yeah, of grandiose yeah. chat about um, saving Test cricket. But how good would it have been for Test cricket to have this week? Like, not mm. just English cricket. And I've, I think... I do feel quite strongly that I, I really wanted that moment for the game in England because we just don't have them enough where it's genuinely like a national moment. I think right. it would have been. 100%. But also the, the format of Test cricket would have like it would have been amazing. But if you look at the next year or two in Test cricket and England's next year or two, like they're going to India for five Test matches, which could be really amazing. It also could be a shit show. It could be a shit show on shit heaps. Like let, mm. let's not get away from that. That could happen. And then they've got. A really flat summer next summer, unfortunately, against uh, opposition which you would who at home you would expect them to beat. I'm not necessarily saying away, but at home you'd expect them to beat. And then they've got the following winter is a, a repeat of a winter we just had, which was tests in New Zealand and Pakistan. So it's kind of like as an England cricket fan, there's nothing terribly new mm. on my horizon at the moment, and it, it kind of doesn't excite me that much. And we could have had something really new and amazing this week, and mm. we've have that taken away from right us. so now we're getting down to it because he's he's bang on the here there was a, a pompous time monday morning everyone's a bit stressed out there, there's a there was a, a poignancy to this series an elegiac feel to this whole series right there's no point pretending otherwise we all know the state that the five-day game is in we all know that the pressure that it's under we all know that it's in a fight for its life all you got to do is flick on the tv and watch what happens in the west indies for, for your heart to to bleed for this thing We've all built our love for the game around that. And what we're seeing this summer is simultaneously a great celebration and almost a farewell tour. And that sounds dramatic, but it's hard to shake that. South Africa play about six games in the next three years. <laughs> you know, as, as Will says, you line it up and it's relatively thin gruel. Fewer test matches than ever before from next summer onwards anyway. In fact, from this summer onwards. Um, and... You hope against hope that these big marquee series do the job, but there's every chance that when England do go to India, they get stuffed on pitches that are con conducive to home home advantage. That's fair enough. That's their decision. But if you're looking at the spectacle, then it, it's weakened by that, as we saw when Australia went out there. That's not a dig at India. That's just the reality of it. That was an underwhelming series, and everyone was up for it. England goes to Australia. They tend to get stuffed, right? So, so you're looking out on a landscape, and you want it to be forever fruitful and forever feeling like it's blossoming and building mm. into something. Uh, this summer felt like that. This summer felt like a rare moment. Um, and we've almost had it. Mm. And it's almost been there. And both teams have done everything in their power to make it so. Yeah. And yet, we can't quite get there. Well, uh, Australia, I mean, fair oh, play. Don't give no, me no, with no, play no, conservative cricket. Don't no, give no, me no, that. Not, not play conservative cricket. Like in, in this game in particular, and fair play to them, they want to retain the Ashes. They had every right to do what they did in this, this game. No, absolutely. This was not anti-cricket or anything no, like I'm that. Not, I'm not saying it is, but, but they, 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 weren't, you know, they weren't going all out to win this game with the team they picked uh, in particular, you know, picking three frontline quicks. No spinner batting down to number eight. They, they've looked at the forecast, realised sure. we need a draw to, to retain the Ashes, sure. and they've picked a team and but, played but, but also, that way, which is fine. But they've also gone to Edgbaston, conceded 400 on the first day, and, and won the game on day five with, a, with an immense run chase, and won, it, won at Lords to go 2 0 up in a series that they haven't won in 22 yeah, 21 yeah, I'm, years, I'm, right? So I'm not really talking about the first at it three in, games. The, in the round. They had every right to hedge their bets a little bit. Uh, sorry, I've got a hair in my mouth. There we go. Every right to hedge their bets in this test match. I don't think this. Um, is redolent of negative pragmatic cricket overall. And I don't really understand that criticism of them. I've heard it here. Okay, they're not as wildly front foot as England. They're not as compulsively watchable in certain ways as England. But they've played fair, interesting and front foot, front foot test cricket overall. It's just not quite as extravagant as, as what the other, the other mm. lot are doing. I think in this test match, they um, England have adapted over the course of the series and I don't think Australia have yet and I think it would have been a really interesting question had England won 
with with the momentum going into the final test match, could Australia arrest that momentum? Well, one of, one of the incredibly annoying things about the whole situation is that bounce ball had actually just cracked Australia in a test match. Like, they won an arm wrestle at Headingley, having lost a couple of arm mm. wrestles. But this one was the first time in this series where a team had surged ahead. And you guys are in the press box. You know what the Ashes, an Ashes press box environment can feel like. And it is probably, I, think, I don't think I'm going too kind of inside baseball or inside baseball here to say that it's the more, the press boxes get more parochial in the Ashes than any other time that I'm aware of. Uh, I haven't, I'm not, you know, India, Pakistan, I'm not, you know, I'm not there. <laughs> so it doesn't happen. Um, but people, national allegiances do run a little hotter in uh, in the press box in the, in this series. And at old, it, uh, after Lords, the Australian media spent essentially a fortnight laughing. They were like, these blokes have been talking about this basball thing for Years, you know, the word got round, but it was a book maybe coming out about it, things like that. You know, they and and they've lost. They've gone tuna down in the ashes, and actually, Australia came really close to putting themselves in whitewash territory. They they found this funny, and then at Old Trafford, the tone changed, didn't it? It it, it kind of to borrow a chant from terraces, it all went quiet over there, and we they they kind of were accepting that maybe actually this thing is the way England should be playing their cricket. We've seen this live. We've seen it rattle Australia for uh, two the two afternoon sessions on day two and day three. The, Australia were all over the shop. They didn't mm. know how, they couldn't contend with England. I think there was an acceptance there from uh, our Australian counterparts, but also maybe the wider Australia fan base. But Christ, this thing, it does exist. It's not totally made mm. up and it can work and it works for this group of players. And then now, <laughs> a few days later, it all doesn't matter because of the rain. And it's not that the ultimate initial project of, of Basball is going to fail, which was the retention of the re, re, regaining of the urn. And they're going to fail in that mission. Mm. Uh, uh, you're right. It's an objectively spectacular performance over three days. Firstly, to have bowled Australia out for 300 odd on a, on a flat one and to have kept coming hard. Now, Australia's approach was maybe a bit, a bit safety first, maybe a bit incoherent at certain points, you know, for, Eight players, I think, to get between 30 and 51 or 55, whatever it was, speaks of a team that perhaps didn't quite know how to go about about the problem of this truncated test match. Nonetheless, England to, to bowl them out for 300 on day one was outstanding. It looked flat. It was flat. And then to rack up that number of runs in, what, 120 overs, I think? Mm. Fewer than 120 overs. Um, they would have probably won that game by an innings, if not sort of, you know, seven or eight wickets tops. Um that would have been objectively astonishing, really, all things considered. And, and Will's absolutely right. England had finally cracked it. They'd picked the right team at Headingley and they'd flowed into this game. Uh, and it's not, it's not being whingy to have wanted that game to have played out to its natural conclusion. Yeah. Um, t I'm trying to lift the mood a little bit. Um, Stokes was asked yesterday, kind of like, how, how does he want his side to be remembered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and obviously they can't win the series now. And, and Stokes said, uh, the reward for your work isn't what you get, it's what you become. And I think, I've been thinking about how this series will be remembered, kind of regardless of what happens in, in the last test match. It has been a genuinely ridiculous series. I can't remember one that's been this entertaining. Um, and, and as much as people like me will be like, oh, we should have batted differently at edge bass and whatever. I think that's sort of losing the bigger picture. Um, first of all, obviously... It doesn't need repeating, but England were, were, were dreadful. Not only were they dreadful, but they were miserable to watch. And the whole point of this experiment was to get everyone involved in cricket to enjoy it again. And I think sometimes we trick ourselves in cricket um, into thinking that because the result is good and what, or what we want, the cricket itself was, was great. But the process of getting there often isn't that enjoyable. But this series has served up so many... Um, of the most watchable passages I can remember. Like the second afternoon at Manchester, that that was one of the most enjoyable bits of cricket I think I've ever seen. Crawley and Root scoring 178 in a session. It, it felt like the World Cup semi-final again. Um, I don't know, like yesterday there was, a, there was an amazing hour where it was hosing it down. Uh, they said that play was going to restart one if there was no more rain. And it, almost as soon as that happened, it started raining again. But then it got to the heaviest it had been all day. 
And then a few of the England guys walked out to play two touch football. And then more and more of the England players kept kept going out. And they uh, were out there for about an hour having like an amazing time uh, whilst everyone else was miserable, was dawning, on, dawning on us what was going on. And I was kind of like, this sort of sums it up. Like everyone else is going like, this is shit, cricket shit, life shit. But England are having a great time. And it's like, it is amazing that England have had, have injected so much enjoyment into cricket when it hasn't been very enjoyable for a really long time. I, I sometimes think that when we sit around this table, we are th- the worst judges of of the mood because we can't shape the fact that we get paid to do this thing, <laughs> right? So there's an extra layer of of stress, frankly. Um, we, th- there are consequences, livelihood consequences, when it goes wrong to us. Um, a better judge of the mood is to ask a hundred people who have switched on, whether they've switched on again or whether they've come to it afresh or whether they are stuck in the game for better or for worse. But I think they're a better judge of, of this, this question. You know, I've got my little WhatsApp group of, of friends. There's one or two on there who have been more enlivened by cricket than they have been for years. They've always liked the game. Some two of them have really liked the game, but you know, you, life gets in the way. Uh, and with, with one in particular, he said he absolutely has been gripped by it completely. I have other friends, friends of friends as well, who have who are, who are there when, when they wouldn't have been before. Um, I guess one of the questions is now they know that really it's an exercise in misery and pain and self-pity. <laughs> Do and they nothing stick more, around? <laughs> nothing more than that in the end and that it will hurt you and destroy you just like everything else does. Now they realise that, I wonder if they're going to be here for Sri Lanka at home next year. So we've got a really good positive email on this, by the way, from James. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he wrote, there's a theory that the best advert for cricket in this country would have been England being 2-1 up going into this test and not relying on the weather rather than playing stylish test cricket. Um, I think this is nonsense. Um, we can tell this because if you look back at Ashes and test cricket since 2005, 2009, 13 and 15 were all great English wins. But the only people really watching were cricket lovers. If you transported yourself back to 2009, most people won't actually be able to regale you the, the stories of Monty and Jimmy saving the day or Freddie destroying Australia on, on one leg and Swan dismissing Hussey to regain the ashes. The reason for this is that the cricket was fantastic for a diehard fan growing up on cricket, but it wasn't really the, the thing that steals national headlines or injects interest to the everyday person. I followed Test cricket religiously since the age of seven. I will sit uh, day after day watching every ball of a Test match, and England winning or losing means a lot to me. However, I've learned to appreciate there's far more to sport than just winning. To win a sporting contest, you need luck and you need tiny details to go your way. Approach things in the right way, and most of the time the results will follow, but not always. So you need to make sure that what you do is about more than just winning. This England team have found an approach to Test cricket that inspires new and old fans to be interested in the game. A drop catch might decide a result, but it doesn't dictate a person's interest in a sporting event. Us badgers might miss the days of cook and trot grounding Australia into the dust over five days, but I can assure you I can assure you that the sight of Zach Crawley and Harry Brook dispatching balls into the stand is far more for the growth of the game. I, I'd also add, I like that a lot, by the way. I'd also add that it's done it's been a shot in the arm for the ashes itself as a as a you know subculture of test cricket and it's struggled a little bit and the one last time out was grim um and the one after 2019 was a slight weird afterthought that summer it's i've already started thinking about what were two and a half years right so it's a long old stretch stretch, but i'm thinking two and a half years on and how much there will be now riding on that series because this is this is enlivened the old the old scrap and it might be that in this sort of like post-apocalyptic scene that that's basically the only stuff that anyone gives a toss about anymore but nonetheless um english pomposity has has pricked australia's interest this summer no doubt and australia will now have held it for what since it'll be, it'll be a decade be, yeah not quite a decade it'll be, it'll be a decade right. it's probably realistically a decade yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, so we get there in a couple of years' time, and and it, and it will be a continuation rather than a than a drift mm. away, you know. And and while you have no idea what England's bowling side will look like, you know the whole Dad's Army thing will have moved on by then. But you still feel like the philosophy is now so embedded in the English game 
that you won't see what we saw last time out with that sort of painful top order mm. and so on and so on. And, and so it will be a ding dong. I mean, it's ridiculous to be talking about it, but my, <laughs> my mind has already gone there. It went there last night watching and, Oppenheimer. And similarly for Australia, because actually looking at that series, you'd expect quite a lot of the guys in this team now to maybe have either that's a, that's a full last or, or to be gone. Like, you know, Kawadra is what, 36 is he? What Warner's the same. Obviously he will have retired by then. Uh, Smith is 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 getting on the bowling attack rule. You know they're great, but they're they're they're, they're moving on. So this actually that that's also what makes this last test absolutely massive for them because they haven't actually really won a huge amount of significance as a group. I mean, obviously, World Championship final, great, but also beat an India team in conditions that suited you, and they India were missing their two best players. Uh, they beat Pakistan one nil, fine, but also Pakistan are what fifth best team in the world. If that's the thing you're clinging to as a great team that you beat, a, a, you know a team that are bottom half really uh and and you you know really struggle way through it and then England come and blow them away like this this if they won at the oval fair play that is a like there's not really a way to to downgrade that that triumph but that's that's their last chance really as a group mm. to do that because also they play so little like it's, cricket a, it's after a bigger that. game for Australia than for England perhaps yeah I think you could tell that from from Cummins reaction for yesterday it, he, he he looked as flat as England did, really. I think they know, they know that was a deeply unsatisfying way to, to, to reclaim. It re sounds a really England. weird thing to say. I think it's a bigger thing for this Australian team, but it's a really big thing for English cricket. So keeping this proud record of not having lost to this lot in England since 2001 is important to us as a wider group. The, the team <laughs> itself might not... I don't know how they feel about that. Mm. But the Austra this set of Australian players who, as Ben says, are almost to a man on their last tour of England. I, you know, Travis Head's got a chance of being back. He's 29. Marnus will be back. Kerry. Ke Ke He'll be 35. Yeah, yeah okay. he's, 30, he's, 30, he's always older than people think. Um, and Cameron Green, obviously. And I actually think Nathan Lyon's got quite a good chance of, of mm. coming back, but he, he's different. But they, they've they got their, they've been talking about the bucket list thing, all tour. Um, and to all is not bucket list. They've done that. They lifted the weight of that bit of history in 2019 and then actually cocked it up, really. Mm. Um, so they're, they're, the only success for them is to win this series. One other little thing about, we talk kind of, it's funny how this little chapter of Ash's history, um, where there's been a series of great players on both sides. So each team has had a bona fide, a great batter in Joe Root and Steve Smith. David Warner's a huge personality of the game, as is Johnny Bairstow. Uh, ben Stokes is one of the great all-rounders and then there's the great bowlers. This little chapter, this decade-long period has been won hands down by Australia in the end because mm. they absolutely destroy us every time we go there. And then here, they're going to get, at worst case, a couple of two-all draws. And then, you know, that they've just they've just kind of, they've, they've it's been a short period with, with featuring a lot of great players and it ends this week because a lot of those players will move on. Some of the English lads have got a chance of going to Australia in 20, um, 25, six. 25, six, but I think Stokes, I, I can't see Stokes having another home ashes. I think 36 years old for Ben Stokes looks very old. Mm. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. We'll mm. Come back to that in a minute. Just, just uh, to establish that point. So England's greatest ever fast bowler or seen bowler will have, if he doesn't play on Thursday, then, He'd have had one. The last Ashes Test that Jimmy won would have been Trent Bridge 2015, right? I think uh, he didn't play. Well, he that didn't one. play he that. Played at Baston, he got injured at Edge right. Baston. Yeah, okay, Ed Baston 2015. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, on, on a similar theme, uh, Stephen asks. I'm sure you'll be getting tons of emails about rain, roofs, and declarations of the disappointment of today. But I was wondering, with no prospect of winning this Ashes series, does the World Test Championship become the main focus of McCullum and Stokes? Uh, there's an upcoming tour of India, but I assume a win there is unlikely. Does there need to be a defining achievement for the basketball era? What Would that be it? More broadly, I've, I've heard lots of people talk about how much these ashes have drawn people into Test cricket. But if they've caught the bug, the prospect of a couple of contextless three Test series next summer might not hold their interest. It seems to me that a properly functioning and defined World Test Championship is key to the future. Yeah of test cricket love the podcast as ever i'm one of those sad gits that punches the air when i see it's going to be an hour and a half episode <laughs> i think you're in luck this week ben well yeah the world championship i mean the, the finals have been great occasions um one thing that i worry about with england like obviously it's presumptuous to think that england are now just good at test cricket and will never have bad periods again but like one of the worries that is is that england being kind of sort of mediocre 
it's been one of the things that kind of te- kept test cricket interesting a lot of the time. <laughs> like, like, because because and they've been mediocre because they have the ability to go to the West Indies and lose. Yeah, but but also to then go to Sri Lanka and, and, and win, nil, uh, yeah. and then and then to get you know to draw a series against against Pakistan at home or whatever. Like that that most quite series fun. in England are, are pretty entertaining. Exactly, yeah, because you can't really tell which England side is going to turn up from from game to game, and it gives other sides something to cling to as well. They can think, okay, we can get there, we, can, we might be able to get a result that we can hang on to. So in a way, I kind of hope that next summer we, we get actually some really good competitive test cricket. And Sri Lanka especially maybe have the chance to to do that. You know, there's some they've got a, a, a decent looking batting lineup and some quick bowlers. Six nil <laughs> yeah. next summer. Yeah, well, Six nil. I mean, I guess. But, but then, you know, they're going to be coming off the back, the back of a tour of India when they might well have been. It will be six nil. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. But but that, that that's that's the worry, isn't it? That like then actually England have been the thing that has meant that you haven't had a proper separation of you know at least okay australia haven't really beaten teams away but at home you know exactly what's going to happen whenever anyone turns up there uh england have done something to keep to keep <laughs> test cricket and therefore and the world's championship interesting and i don't know kind of hope that doesn't fade even if uh you also want mm. to see how this thing keeps going I don't if know. this series ends to all could the world test championship be the 2023 ashes the, the final in 2025 be the decider of the 2023 oh. ashes uh, I don't I th- think it can. I don't think Australians would agree to that. But you yeah. know, I think that actually England have got a, they these two teams have got a very good chance of being back. Uh, mm. It's meant to be at Lords, but back in London for that that game. I think actually that is quite a nice little tangible aim for England. Mm. I think uh, that that will have been the it's two years time for now, so it will be kind of three year project at that point. I think Stokes could make it that far. I don't know how much further beyond that he could make it, but uh, as a as a batter, that is by the way. Yeah. So so if you discount the the bowling side of things. Do you just see that he wouldn't have the energy motivation to keep going for four more years? Yeah, I, I just I just think physically, actually, it's, it's right. the, 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 one of the things about the last year, it, or the last, even the last month, is that Moen's um, emergence or return to replace the spinner, the leech injury offered them an opportunity uh, to address an, uh, an issue that they weren't really prepared to address, which was that Stokes is in uh, bad physical shape to bowl you know for instance he has not he's not bowled for two tests in a row now and we're not talking about him bowling mm. in the oval are we we're not we're not considering we're not really seeing that as an option well, he might he might bowl a turn up and bowl a turnover over spell because it's ben, ben stokes but i mean he half jokingly retired from bowling yeah he, he, in his press conference yeah. he made a he, he, he said that i used to do it or something like that didn't he i, I know how tough bowling is because i used to do it yeah it, it was a joke but um he yeah they the mo the, the the, cut, the two injuries they've had, which are not insignificant, by the way. It's for two of the players who've played the first whole first year of, of the project. So mm. obviously Lyon's injury is massive in the series, but so are both those two. Um, they've replaced him with one player, <laughs> them with one player, which has allowed Stokes to not bowl. How do England set their team up going forward if, if that's going to continue to be the admission? I think next summer they probably can get away with playing a frontline spinner like Jack Leach and then three seamers against, mm. against that opposition and, and probably winning most games mm. but uh, generally that's not the case they've team for it, even their next series after this one in india in six months time don't ask me to name a team for it because <laughs> it could it could be anything mm. yeah i kind of fancy though that stokes might just uh, he'll, he'll try and figure out if it's at all possible to get 20 to 27 do you not do you not think phil that like he'll look at me like oh if i if i don't play this one i play this one and i you know take this injection and i have this surgery and i can just about just push myself through to it with this series having gone the way it has like and he, he as much as he gets injured loads he also defies what you think is possible and you know has comebacks that you don't think other players would have and I kind of think that he will try and figure out if it is feasible and if it is then he might well just find a way to, to be involved somehow so, sort of like Flint of 2009 I guess I, I think when you get to his point in his career and he can control what he does and how much time he takes out from his own career I think there's certainly a way that he leads them to Australia and I would expect that he wants to do that. And then if you were to just look at it practically, so if you, if you say for the next two and a half years, everything builds to that. He's not going to be playing ODIs. He's almost certainly not going to come back for the World Cup because we assume that he's possibly going to go under the knife. That's your theory at least, yes, and there's probably something in that. Either way, he's, not play, he's, he's going to be knocking back the formats. He'll have his IPL period and then you'll have half a dozen test matches and then you can rest again for another few months so the next two and a half years i think are taken care of barring something bad and then from that point you can really manage your life you can manage your output very easily you can say right well 
I'm not going to do that IPL straight after the ashes because my body's going to be knackered. Or you can do it and then have basically two or three months off after that. Then you're only getting through one summer. And as we know, fewer and fewer test matches anyway. He's got no other obligations to play anything else. It will come down to his body, but I think his mind will be with it still. Because as much as they're not results-based, he, he's, he burns for this stuff. And I don't see there being a fall, falling away really that much of motivation three, four, three or four years down the line. The, the one thing I would maybe add is that there is a shelf life to all captains and you get tired and you get weary and the job starts to eat away at you. Now, Stokes seems sort of inoculated from normal equations. <laughs> Uh, but very few captains do five, four, six, five, four, indeed, six, four years. Indeed, indeed. Mm. The, the fact that, as I say, he can order his life around the test job may help to extend it a bit. I think that I think Australia down under. I think that's that's a given. If he's fit, then he, he leads them, leads them there. Mm. Who the hell he leads with him? Is another question. But we can come um, to that in the next two and a half years. <laughs> Before we head to Butch uh, for this episode's Kia's movement that inspires moment, Kia is giving you the chance to win a pair of tickets to the cricket that really matters: Oval Invincibles versus Welsh Fire uh, at the Kia Oval on uh, August the sixth. Uh, for a chance to win tickets to that, all you need to do is enter via the link in the description. Anyway, here's Mark Butcher. Butch. How are you feeling and how do you think England fans should be feeling right now? <laughs> um, well, a little deflated, yeah. Um, uh, you know, the the first three days, the performance was exactly what England have been looking for from the, from the beginning of the series, really. Um, but the forecast was, was bad from, from a long way out. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of, did exactly what it promised to do. So, look, I you know I've played enough played enough cricket to know that, that battling against the elements, trying to win games, um, you know, before the rain comes in, or trying to save games before the rain comes in, have always been part of the, the game of cricket. Uh, and it's a shame the series or the Ashes have been decided that way, but the series is still alive. Um, and and you know, in, England. England really will look back on on the whole thing, no matter what happens at the Oval. It's, it's sort of lost opportunity, I think, because you know even in the first two Test matches that they lost, they had they had opportunities to to have reversed both of those um, both of those uh, results, uh, and you know just weren't weren't quite smart enough or quite experienced enough, perhaps, to to take advantage of them in those first two games, which left them with a mountain to climb. I described it to. Uh, or, or sort of compared to Sisyphus's stone, you know, the guy had to push it, push the rock up the hill, and you kind of get halfway there, and it rolls back, rolls all the way back to the bottom again. I mean, winning three on the bounce against Australia is just, you know, that's a it's a Herculean task, and um, you know they probably would have won the game, but for the weather. But mm. still, you know, that's that's baked into to cricket in England, isn't it? You know, bad, bad weather has always played a part, and sometimes it helps you out, and sometimes it dumps all over you, and that's the game. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess it is just quite hard to square that the only reason why we're not going into the final test at 2-2 is that just we, we had an abnormal July weather pattern. Um, <laughs> just, um, yeah, I mean, and look, and, and the thing is, I kind of, I had a horrible feeling that that might be the case. We had such a dry, it was so dry, April, May, June. And I seem to, I seem to remember, and I'm probably not right, but I seem to remember that the last, the last couple of years, it's been the same. We kind of that we get to the what's supposed to be the height of summer, and suddenly the weather takes a turn for the worst. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that's what's undone the whole thing. Mm. And and it's frustrating on a, on a couple of levels from from an England point of view. One that we don't get the finale that it seemed that everything was going towards. But number two, that was an incredible performance from England. That that would have been their crowning performance. It, it still is the crowning performance, really. I know that there's the Royal Pindy test, but that was against a very very different caliber. Of opposition here, England ran Cummins and Stark ragged. Their major selection calls were were vindicated in uh, an emphatic style that no one could really have predicted. It, it was just from a cricketing point of view a, a, a sublime England performance. It was, yeah. All of those things are one hundred percent correct. Uh, and you got the press conference of the of the of the millennium as well um, from Johnny Bairstow just to just to top it all off. Um, yeah, a, a staggering performance. I mean, you know, in many ways, that the fact that the forecast was as it was kind of pushed England to go 
you know, to go total baseball from from the beginning. Um, you know, the batting, as always, will take the the, the plaudits going at seven and over for um, for for that that incredible passage of play um, on day two with Zach Crawley and Joe Root. Moen Ali played superbly at the number three. Um, but but bowling Australia out on day one on that or day one and a bit on that pitch for a, a very, very small first inning score for the conditions was also an absolute triumph as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, I think that they will, they will rightly say that that was, that could very well have been the, the absolute peak baseball performance um, ever since this whole thing began. Um, and so, of course, it's a shame, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of reading and listening, you know, listening to all radio programs this morning and people getting very, people who don't normally mention cricket, it's all getting very uptight about the, the weather and saying that there should be reserve days and all these types of things. Well, we've never had them in test match cricket. Test matches have been ruined by weather since time began. Um, and yes, it's, a, it's an absolute crying shame. Um, that it's ended up the way that it has. But it's also a crying shame that over the first three days of play, we lost an entire session to, to poor over rates. An entire session in three days, you know, 20, 26, 27 overs. I suppose the fact that I'm saying 26 gives you a clue as to why <laughs> gives you a clue as to why you lose so much time. But you know, these things, you know, these things kind of all add up to to frustrations that are there. Um, that are not to do with um, the gods and things that you can't do anything about. Mm. If you um, if if your post playing career went slightly differently and you ended up in um, the hot seat at the ICC um, instead of being over the Zoom with me and you you had total control over how cricket could deal with over eights in Test cricket, what what would you do? Well, I'd, very simply, I just I'd make it compulsory to bowl thirty overs in a session. That's that's what I would do. Um, I think a ten thirty start in in the UK is probably a good thing. Um, through the sort of the channel four years when I was playing, we we started at ten thirty because they had to get it in before the news or whatever. Um, and that was and that was absolutely fine. You know, it didn't make any difference to conditions. It does. I, I understand. You know, with TV ratings wise, it kind of you miss that that that, that peak time at the back end of the, of the day, um, perhaps. And so that's a that's that's always a consideration, no matter what anybody says. Um, but you know, a half ten start, and and I just I simply just wouldn't allow the players to go off for for lunch or tea until the third the overs were done in the session, which would do two things. You know, it would it would it would annoy the players, but it would annoy the umpires as well because their breaks get diminished, and force teams into doing something about um, the speed at which they bowl their overs, the type of teams that they pick. You know, if you if you go into to, into matches without specialist spin bowlers and without any intention of using spin, then then your over rates are going to be slow. Um, uh, and and do something in game to force the issue to make to make everybody get on with it. Um, that would that would be my my thing. Mm. I don't you know I don't think you can have an open ended finish on the day. I think it needs to you need to know at some point that, that there is going to be an end. Mm. But I would say I'd, I'd start taking the time out of the. Out of the, 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 the what, have, what have you got, 11, 13, the 15 blokes on the field, you, you make them responsible for the amount of time off in the day that they get. And, you know, and, and, I, and I bet you it make a difference. Mm. Um, you, you're right to point to a few moments from the first two tests that if England controlled them better, the series wouldn't be over or the Ashes wouldn't be over at this point. Um, one that I haven't really heard many people talk about retrospectively is that, Sure, Mark Wood wasn't fit to play in the first two test matches. Chris Wokes was. Um, he wasn't selected for that Ireland test match. He actually played quite a lot of county cricket um, at the start of the summer. We knew he was in pretty good rhythm. We know that what his record is like in, in, in English conditions. And I know that not that many people were calling for him to play at the start of the summer because he hadn't played that much test cricket in English conditions in the last few years. And, and he, he also hadn't played a part in, in baseball up until that yeah. point, had he? He'd kind of like he disappeared. Um, so, look, I mean, I think that's, that is a massive hindsight from for mm. anybody that says, oh, you know, well, Chris Woke should have been playing from the beginning is, is really having a laugh. Because I didn't, you know, no, nobody, he was off the radar completely. Um, and sometimes that happens, you know, you get, you get halfway through a series and injuries and whatever else happens and you, you pull somebody out of the hat and they have, a, they have an absolute blinder and you wish they'd been there from the start. But I think I, I can't see any, any way that that would have been worked out any differently from the beginning. Um, you know, the, the, 
the, the other things, the other major, the other major calls, really, I suppose, you know, the, the Moeen Alley being brought out of retirement call. Um, I never had a, I had an issue with, with him being brought out of retirement. Um, and, and that stays the same really. But once he's, once he's in and once he's, once he's going, you want him to do, want him to do the, the job that he's required to do. And he's done that since he's been in. I mean, I thought he played fantastically at number three the other day. He showed, um, he showed Travis Head how to play the short ball. That's for sure. And kind of, and got them to stop bowling it at him a little bit as we, as we've discussed before. Mm. Um, and so that was a, a terrific performance from him. Um, and, you know, and Zach Crawley has been has been the, one of the better batters for England in the entire series up until this point. Now he's I, I bumped into Keezy, who came up into the box during the during the game, and I sort of said he's I've noticed he's made a little a little adjustment, something that we we'd spoken about um, at length with the, using the lines and using third man on the TV about where his his weight is in his stance, and he seems to have kind of got that in a much better position where the head leads a bit more. Um, and and I also and I'm going to say this. I'm going to big myself up. I, I walked into the press box on whatever day it was, and I said, Zach Cole is getting 100 today with, with Dean Wilson and somebody, I can't remember who the other one was, as a witness. And I also said it first thing in the morning, said Nasser Hussain. Because it just, that those conditions with that type of pitch and him in, in half-decent nick, he just felt that this that was that was his, it could be his day. And goodness gracious me, was it ever. Hmm. Um, you know, he played he played sublimely. Yes, there were, you know, there were the odd, sort of skewy drive over over the slips and things like that in the in the early parts but um you know Australia didn't quite get weren't disciplined enough to hold that line for long enough and he absolutely destroyed them um and it was it was a, a vindication of of everything that that um Brendan and, and Ben have been saying about picking that guy you know mm. so fair play to him well, he's obviously a very strange player in that his strengths are where other players tend to have their weaknesses and his weaknesses tend to be where most English batters who end up playing for England uh, are, are good at. What, why is he so good against Stark and Cummins but actually struggles against the bowlers who look more like county bowlers in, in, the, in, in Mitchell Marsh, for example? Like, but wh- wh- why, why is he? Why can he be so good against Stark and Cummins but struggle against, on paper, lesser bowlers? I think he really, you know, really needs and, and enjoys the, the ball coming on at him. You know, something that he can he can react to and, and go at hard when you when the ball is nibbling around and isn't moving quite so quickly. You have to be a lot more precise in terms of um, your, you know, your your technical aspects. Um, uh, but the fact that he that he hits the ball so damn hard, um, the fact that he's very very good on the short ball, you know, the ball above his waist. Um, means that you know the 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 sort of the the harder and bouncier the pitch and the and the quicker the bowlers, the more comfortable um, he is. And you know that's he's he's kind of made for he's made for Test match cricket. The fact that the fact that some of the the bowling and some of the pitches in Test match cricket at times can feel a bit more like county cricket is is perhaps one of the reasons why he's had a rough old time. But I also think that technically the adjustment that he's made will make the world of difference in terms of a bit of consistency. Um, and also, and I think Athers is right to mention this on the TV. He, you know, he talked about the fact that Australia have set the fields back to him from the beginning, which mm. has meant that he's actually kind of he's just been quite happy to ro- he rotate the strike. And he said it in his his post match interview that um, you know he he kind of he he got up the other end often. He didn't feel like feel as though he was being lined up by a bowler to make a mistake. He kind of every time he hit it. He'd get one and disappear at the other end. So that's uh, you know a, a sort of a, a failure um, tactically of Australia against that particular player that has allowed him to get himself in. And then once he's in, he's very dangerous. Mm. Um, you mentioned Bairstow's press conference. He gave a typically punchy round of interviews after his ninety nine not out, where he talked about how tough it's been for him coming back from um, not only such a severe injury but also having not really kept wicket for three years. We had an email in from a listener called Paul who had a similar injury himself 10 years ago. And he said, I'm not sure that everyone really appreciates how every tiny movement for Johnny will be a new experience and and no doubt a new pain. The fact that he is less than a year out from such a horrific break and walking is amazing, let alone playing sport at the highest level. I processed that Bearstow press conference with two main thoughts. One, it is incredible how quickly Bearstow has come back. But two, surely everything he just said is is exactly why he shouldn't have been given 
the gloves. <laughs> England, England are so creative in finding solutions to other problems. You know, Moeen's the the spinner and the number three when they when they have injury to the, those yeah. two guys. But here they were oddly rigid with their team composition at the start of the series. It wasn't. I, I know it's really difficult to, to say who should have been left out because Duckett's been good, Crawley's been good, uh, Best has been good with the bat. It's really difficult, but there was that problem. There wasn't a fix with the eleven they went out with, and it and, and it has actually proven costly. Like they they probably win at Edgebaston with a with with a Besto who who whose keeping was where it was two two three years ago, and they couldn't possibly have 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 known that his keeping would be fine. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's entire, that's why the, the press conference was absolute gold because he basically vindicated all of the criticism that we were throwing their way before the series started was that he couldn't possibly be fit and ready enough to keep wicket. He hadn't done it for ages. Um, and, you know, and that, and that gamble might prove to be costly. And basically, he basically went out there and threw, and threw the entire selection, pa- selection panel under the bus by saying he wasn't ready. Um, you know, so it was, that's why, that's why I found it very amusing. I mean, no, nobody, no, I don't think there's a single person that said Johnny Bairstow shouldn't have been in the team. It wasn't a single person that said that he, should, that he wouldn't have been valuable to him at the batter somewhere. The problem from the start for, for all of the critics, all of us lot, was it was him keeping wicket. And he basically went out there and told everybody that, yeah, that was a massive problem and I, I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> so I was just kind of, I was crying with laughter watching the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but fair play to him. What, a, what an innings. Yeah. Um, and and he also you know he caught he, he did catch a blinder didn't he caught a yeah. terrific catch to get to get rid of Mitch Marsh, um you know which he's which which he's always likely to do something like that I mean he's a terrific sports person a terrific ball player yes he had to go through hell uh, and work unbelievably hard to get himself back and, and no I don't think anybody was I don't think anybody kind of denies that that it was hard but the but the criticism was that he probably shouldn't have been doing it um and he agrees. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> just finally Australia have retained the Ashes it's, it's now been uh, what six seven years with the with the Ashes in, in their hands what what do you think they'll be feeling right now um, it feels like the, the Oval Test match is, is absolutely enormous for them and how this team is remembered yeah absolutely I mean I, I think Look, if the if the game had gone on, they would have lost it. I think I don't think there's any any doubt about that. They were they were right up against it in serious trouble. But you know, the forecast was the forecast from the start, and and that's and that's the way you go. That's that's unlucky. I remember us all running off, whooping and hollering at, after getting away with one in Brisbane way right back in 1997, and with a massive storm rolled in and wiped out the last session. Brilliant, and you know we're happy, they're sad, um, and that's the way it goes. Um, but I, I still think that the, this test match is going to absolutely fizz with uh, with excitement. You've got England who are kind of who have found their mojo again, and they're going to they're going to come out sort of absolutely annoyed and and, and bristling with intent to uh, you know to, to 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 put the cherry on that performance from Manchester and, and, and level the series two two. And for Australia, none of their players have been on the winning side of a series in England, and they are all going to want to put that on their CV. Some of them will not be back again. Um, and, and Australia will then be able to say absolutely 100% that they, they, they have regained or retained the Ashes and won the series. So, look, it's still going to be huge. It's still going to be a great, great occasion. For my money, every Test match anyway is, is a sort of occasion on its own, regardless of what's gone before. Um, and this one will actually have as much on it as, as there could possibly be, given that the Little Urn is staying um, with Australia and in the MCC Museum. Hmm. Well, I'm glad that you're you're looking forward to the to the fifth test. Um, that, that's more upbeat than than we were. Uh, no, but mate, just yeah. spin it. Just have a think about it. I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna be absolutely epic. I mean, it, it, you know, do you think Australia are going to be happy about the way they were dealt with in in Manchester? You know, for that to be the overriding sort of feeling about how the Ashes was was won. Yeah. So they're gonna they're gonna come roaring at us at, at, at the Oval, and we will roar right back. Um, and, and I think it's going to be, <laughs> if the weather doesn't follow us south, um, I think it's going to be an absolutely epic encounter once again. So uh, so cheer up, everyone. All right? Cheer up. Uh, I think that's a, a good place to finish. Cheers for your time, Butch. Catch you next week. <laughs> no worries. Can I ask, because I haven't been reading everything, anything because I've been trying to look after myself, what are the big issues that have come out? Presumably overrates, playing past half, six, seven or whatever, starting early? 
I was uh, just about roots? to get to, right, to, okay. to, to all of this. Okay, but um, I'm asking you, yes, because um, I don't know. But before we go there, all all our Ashes moments of the week are brought to you by our dapper partners, Charles Tirrett, the British menswear brand. You know a thing or two about looking sharp, whether you're working or weekending. Plus, you might recognise their new brand partner, Joe Root. You can channel Joe's style with 20% off by heading online to charlestirrett.com and using the promo code WISDOM23 at checkout. Um, and and Ben, surely the Charles Tirrett moment of the week is the 26 lost overs across days one, <laughs> two, and three. Uh, ben, what do you think but about that? That's what they were looking there? for when they struck this deal. <laughs> I, was, I was fully expecting Zach Crawley then. Uh, yeah, I mean, over eights, I don't know. Like I, I've genuinely been kind of an agnostic on the importance of overrates for for entertainment. Like I think that sometimes you get, you know, people say, "Oh, the the crowd's been missold him, and they've had eight six overs of incredible Test cricket," and people would rather they'd have four overs of part time spin bowled in that. Equally, I think more of an issue is when it becomes sort of like a competitive element of the game, and when teams can pick. And both both sides over rates were really bad, and it is based that's that's what deprived us partly of of at least a, a more grandstand finish, if not a result. Um, and and the ICC because of an intervention from Usman Khawaja, uh, who called up Wazim Khan, who he, he he knows, and said these penalties are really hurting us. Can you reduce them? Have decided that we should have less severe punishments for them. Now I don't think fines would be the way to. Uh, uh, to solve bad overrates anyway, because always you're go- unless the punishments are in game, you're going to get times when the result is more important than any external punishment from the game. So the only way to solve it is an in game punishment, and it has to be that rather than extending play, because extending play doesn't work for so many reasons. One, from an entertainment point of view, then you actually do get possibly an issue because you can get people bowling ten overs an hour with no, you know, n- no repercussions, and then you can uh, fine, we'll play till eight thirty p.m. and we'll bowl. Per hour, and it'll be super slow. That would be actually dull to watch. So you need something that happens in the game that will affect the teams that are going slowly. And you also need a way, and then you also need something that stops the batting side from slowing the game down as well. Which I guess would be something like, you know, you you make drink like you, you can't come onto the field unless you're replacing equipment that is damaged uh, or it's an injury thing, and that's the only times you can have people come on. Uh, so you need an in-game penalty, which is yeah, probably runs, and you need something to stop batters taking interruptions, and that's the that's the only way I can see that you can solve it if you think it is is a big issue, which I'm still not fully decided on. But in this mm. game, and you saw it in the World Championship final as well, and Australia have, have cannily had it this series where they've been able to bowl Stark and Cummins lots. And that's been a tactical thing. And they have kind of, I guess, accepted mm. the overrate punishments that were going to come their way or backed themselves to bowling it out in a short enough period of time. Suited and- England on, on day two, that. Hmm? suited England on day two that well yeah that, that that that's true but then but then equally England would have quite liked the extra overs they could have had on mm. on day two which which were lost I suppose I I was at the Usman Khawaja press conference where he made the revelation that he had um personally intervened to sort out over eights and it was it was actually really weird because he wasn't asked about it he just volunteered this information that he'd um called up his uh was in Khan who he got to know through the Pakistan Super League and and, and asked for this to be changed what um the people I spoke to when that decision was made last week, by week four last by the ICC, were saying, well, actually, um, the issue is at the moment we are finding, pl- at a time when we're desperately trying to attract players to test cricket in, in the face of, um, you know, r- r- a very significant rival in T20 leagues, uh, we're, we're actually not paying them to play. So the, the exa- in the England squad, Ben, ben Duckett, I think in the, this eleven this week is the only player who's not got a contract <coughs> of any form. Harry Brooks not a central contract, but he's not. He's got an incremental. Ben Duckett's actually been losing money to play. He's not getting paid to play for England over the last month. Now he doesn't mind that, but in some of the more economically challenged, uh, con- you know, cricketing countries, I think that is an issue. I agree with Ben that I, I'm. Al- I've also always been a bit agnostic about this issue, but that is partly, I think, an, an acknowledgement that I get paid to be there, and the hours that I'm there are the same, mm. anyway. And I, I do understand why paying punters find it so incredibly frustrating sometimes. I, my big problem is with it is that eh, you can't attribute blame to one side. You watch Steve Smith bat, and he is he's a major contributor to uh, uh, slow over rates like gloves and fidgeting and all sorts of other bits he he slows the game down himself and batters can do that cynically 
in their own way. So just simply punishing the fielding mm. side doesn't really work for me. Um, I do. I think umpires need, need to sort the shit out, frankly, because you you know they they they're just as complicit in this stuff being slow as anyone else, and maybe they're the only people with the authority to actually sort it out. Um, in-game penalties would be good, but I just don't know exactly how you do it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Joe Root said we should be playing until 10pm, uh, which is which is optimistic. Um, I guess I, I guess I don't really have a strong view on it, other than I do think it's odd that so little is done to try to retrieve the lost overs. Like, 26 overs is just quite a lot to lose, and you could start at 10 I think just a general, a, a bit more general agility mm. to uh, with the start times and things like that. And I know that in England we've got issues with train times and things like mm. that, and people travelling to the ground. But I think if there was an understanding that... Your, the start the scheduled start is 11 o'clock but it might be 10 34 mm. because we've got 26 minutes to make up or something like that I think if you just had that it was a known thing I think I think people would, would mm. not mind that too much um we sort of dealt with this earlier um Phil could England have declared earlier uh, Oscar asked lots of declaration chat at the moment can you and the team please confirm whether or not hindsight is a wonderful thing <laughs> <laughs> nicely done uh, you know, you you can argue the toss, can't you? By my or the other, it, it certainly wasn't um, negligent or wrong with a capital W. Uh, again, going back to my little my little sort of straw poll team on my WhatsApp, there were some saying, well, you know, they might even declare on the second evening, uh, see if they can get fifty seventy five ahead and have half an hour dart. And there were other people saying, no, just bat and bat. You know, then you got the conditions in your favour come days four and five, and obviously a bit of day three as well, or half of day three as well. Um, there's a strongish case to have declared at lunch on day three, I suppose, but I can absolutely understand why they didn't. The thing is, everybody was saying, every meteorologist out there and every AccuWeather expert and so on, they were all saying, Saturday's looking like a washout and Sunday we should be all right by about lunchtime, two o'clock. And it flipped round completely. Mm. So you can't really make a call based entirely on that because as we we as it as it showed it was inconsistent yeah, anyway I'm, I'm glad we're on this the, the meteorologist had a shocker um like there's one point where i was looking at the met office and it was telling me that it was raining at that current point but it but it wasn't raining outside um um i, I don't <laughs> i think i think england did really well to get them four down anyway on that day yeah because it was a relatively well, wood, flat wood, wood was brilliant and, and they were yeah wood was astonishing and they're playing in a certain way anyway understandably so runs were would also have been a factor as well they finished up what 60 odd behind i think um so you know you lose that impetus after lunch on day three and then australia would have already been on the verge if not they would have actually gone past it by that point uh then you don't want to have a dirty 150 run chase on, you know, in and out of the showers and all the rest of it. So I could absolutely understand the logic for what it's worth. I argued that I'd probably have batted on and on mm. as much as I can. Uh, you just don't expect to lose two, two full days. You expect to get half a day's cricket out of that. As it was, they got a third mm. and, cru and that was crucial. Mm. I think at lunch on day three, I thought they would actually, I thought they would declare. Um, and I wasn't very unhappy when they didn't. And I thought they maximised the time really well. I thought Australia looked even more rattled in the Bairstow-Anderson partnership than they did in the Crawley-Root partnership, partly because they were actually having the piss taken out of them mm. at that point with the, with the buys know, the, the and stuff like that. But even when they had a short leg, they couldn't sort out. Mm. Um, it was amazing how the got, wheels did fall off. Yeah, the, it was, it was the, extraordinary. The coming to, who, you know, he's a champion of champions, front cover of our magazine, you know, and... and was dropping catches and was missing runouts and was going at a run of ball and getting first ballers and spooning chances to you know, the, the first mm. ball of the, the game and uh, first ball of the day and chasing the game to an almost ridiculous proportion. Like when to watch. James Anderson backs away and smashes you through square leg, he's not going to do that repeatedly. And yet, as soon as that happened, he puts a man out on the fence at square leg and he it's moved, like moved two fielders to cover for that one shot. Yeah. It, was, mm. it was extraordinary. Uh, yeah, and so I think that they they. It was sound theory and the idea that actually we're more likely to run through these lads in fewer overs on day three uh, by having really spooked them out with a you know a, a, a sixty wicket last mm. uh, sixty wicket tenth sixty run tenth wicket partnership. Uh, it didn't work out like that. I think the likelihood is Australia were always going to score 
at least 300-ish runs a game in their second innings. And therefore, it's how you calculate how you're going to get more runs of them. Mm. Do you give yourself, as Phil says, a dirty little score to maybe chase in the rain on the last day? We've seen some low bounce as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the on route, day two. Yeah. The root dismissal was, and actually Crawley's dismissal bounced mm. in a way that he didn't expect. Stokes, his first ball or second ball got up. There was loads of reason to think the pitch would do a bit more than it did. I think Labuschagne got one ball from Broad that stayed mm. low, but it wasn't on the stumps. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was. I think it was sound theory. I, I, I think as we said at the start of the pod, you've got nine sessions to win a match on a flat pitch. I just don't yeah. see how you can do much more than score six hundred at five point five and over. Yeah, Phil, on the cricket itself, how many more tests do you reckon England will give Zach Crawley up top? <laughs> <laughs> um, a friend of mine on Saturday night said, uh, "You've had a good test, Phil. Boat. <laughs> you've had a good test." Um, yeah, look, it, it was, it, no, I mean, it was extraordinary. It, 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 it was, was it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a special knock. It's a really, really special knock. He obviously rode his luck as he acknowledges himself. It was a fascinating interview he gave to Sky, I thought, mm. at the end of day two. And, and, you know, just reiterating the points that we've had, but acknowledging that he, there are days when he doubts himself, but he's just got to try and remember why he's there, why they back him. Uh, trying to be consistent. He said, trying to bat like Joe. As it makes me worse, can't do it, and so it's 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 been a good game for vindication of England selections hmm. overall. Uh, Wokes was an inspired choice, and he's been fabulous for two Test matches. Wood, I think, was always going to play. It doesn't take a genius to have picked him, of course, but but Moeen to bring him back, I think that's a net win overall. Uh, I thought he bowled really nicely in the third test match. He was a bit ragged in the fourth, admittedly, but again, made a very important 50-odd back and three. Uh, and the, the Crawley thing, look, he's he's had a good series. And, Leading run scorer. And, and the thing is, the, the, the pitches that have maybe nullified England's... Anderson has been nullified in part because they have pushed for pitches of a certain quality and certain properties, and it's benefited Crawley. And so Crawley can play through the line. And look, I've always said it, we've always known, as a player of the quicks, if he can ever get his head right and realise he's not playing under 13s cricket where you can just play through the line of everything, a little bit more judgment, he plays the quicks really, really brilliantly. He naturally plays the quicks. Uh, and you can't teach that. You, can't, you cannot teach that. That's why he's been in the team. They talk about his match winning potential, sure. But it's the way that he can shift the momentum against champion fast bowlers. That's why he's in the team, and that's what we saw. It was it was spectacular. He can be consistently a, spectacular. He can be a, a comically impetuous batter at times, but he's got this lovely temperament about everything else he does in the game on and off the field. Like at times, you've been we've been led to believe that the only reason England will want him in the side is because his dad's a member at Sunningdale, <laughs> and actually, he's this really chilled out, pragmatic guy who is rolling the punches, is capable of these extraordinary moments. And now, Ed Smith actually wrote a good column um, in the Sunday Times this week. A lot, of, Quite a few of his columns lately have been kind of like um, reflecting on some of the things he did well as selector. <laughs> so he, like, he, he likes this new team structure that England have got with lots of bowling options. Yeah, yeah. And, but, he, but that he is was, fair, though. Yeah, no, it no, is it, is, it is fair. He, he did open up that idea. England don't lose many games him. with this structure of a team. Mm. But he, I mean, he's also written about Crawley, who he was obviously the, the national selector who picked him first. And um, what he was saying is that actually Crawley is... McCullum's on about not wanting to be a consistent player. He's not still not a truly consistent player, but what he's doing is he's marrying the great peaks that we know he could have around them it's for the proper 30s and 40s rather than single figures. And mm. he, he is still contributing to games even when he, he's not absolutely smashing it. He's had a really good series. As you say, he's a leading run scorer, which is staggering. And and also, it's the stuff that makes him frustrating that made him so good here, I thought. Like, it's, it's the, the fact that, you know, he'll he'll come out, he'll, he'll cover drive one and he'll, he'll nick off and he'll come out and play the same shot the next innings. Sometimes that can be really frustrating. In this innings, it meant that like, because he did get some luck at times, and he wasn't at all cowed by it, right? Like there was probably the closest inside edge was the one that flew just past the stumps and then Kerry got a fingertip on it and it goes down to the fence. I think it was the next over. He reverse sweeps uh, ahead to get to 50 and then slog sweeps into the stands. And that's the kind of, that's what was so good about this was that it, he it, he rode his luck, but he actually rode it. Like he was like, right, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna care that I'm edging a few. I'm gonna play in actually pretty calculated, risky ways. And if I do get a life fine, I'm going to keep doing that. And that can be 
frustrating other times and you're like well you've just you've just made that mistake and now you're doing it again whereas here it it came off and that's what was what was so good about it and England also needed it obviously it didn't work out but you know the fact they had any chance at all was because of, of Crawley playing the innings and playing it so quickly and any other opening batter when there's you know the ball's doing a bit the bowlers are getting their chances are going to draw back a bit Crawley didn't and that is what makes mm. him so so special I guess I think one of the things that is it has irritated people. There's a number of things that have irritated people about the Zach Crawley saga. One is the sense of uh, being given more advantages than than is is fair, and has been the recipient of those kinds of advantages, and that he's been molly coddled and cosseted in the setup to an unreasonable degree. So that's something that's always bothered people. Another thing that's bothered people is it is it sort of pulls at the pulls at the edges of what they understand Test cricket to be. And on a certain level, it upsets people that opening batsmen or batters are no longer presented to them in the form that they've grown up with and they're, they're comfortable with. With, you know, stick-thin grey nickels power spots and playing it off the back foot and playing it late under your eyes. And a bad back. And a bad back. <laughs> Bless him. And, you know, in, in the form of Cook, two mm. and a half shots, 12,000 runs. Gooch, three shots. 10,000 runs. Um, instead, we... And I think much of it is... Stokes was on that tour of, of Australia last time out. And Crawley was there in the shadows. But those first two or three test matches, I remember speaking to someone high up in English cricket, but not attached to the team at the time. And he said, we cannot go in with those opening batters. Nothing against them personally. Good players. But repelling and blunting and waiting to be swallowed up you can't play the game like that anymore especially in those conditions in australia in the pressure cooker against those kinds of quicks uh stokes watched all of that stokes has spoken about this as well he's spoken about how travis head was one of the like the, the unwitting godfathers of basball because he saw how the game shifted when he came in hmm. obviously stokes has form in that himself he would have seen that he'd have seen the opening bats he'd have seen the number three as well and he'd have thought we can't do it like that we're just asking for trouble. Crawley came in latterly in that series, played, made a 70-odd, and got the Australians' attentions on the back of that. It's always been slightly funny that English fans question him a lot more than Australian fans do because they've seen how they, he deals with, with bowlers that other players with better records haven't been able mm. to. I think Ponting said, said approximately after that innings, he should, this should earn him like 10 tests. Mm. And it obviously earned him like Slightly 20. more than that, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was, I, was, I was at Sydney for that night and it was... Actually, quite a, it was a breathtaking innings. Mm. It was pulling Cummins in front of square <laughs> in a way that no one has before or since. I think. Yeah, I think two two things. I, I think out of the three controversial England selections this series, so I guess Bairstow, Moeen, and, and Crawley at the very start. I think two of those three, there's an admission that there's not that much underneath. So with Moeen, there's not another spinner. Obviously, the all round stuff that helps. I think with Crawley, they've looked at so many guys who've got runs in county cricket who've struggled against the best sides in the world. Um, the other thing about Crawley that it almost gets lost um, is we know that his head-to-head -head record against Stark and Cummins is genuinely absurd. He is basically better against Australia's best two bowlers than he is against anyone his, else. His dismissals of this series of Boland twice at uh, Edgbaston, Lyon stumped, Stark down the leg side, so they're two proper bowlers in silly ways, then Marsh twice at Headingley, and now Green got mm. him at um, Old Trafford. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. He's got seven dismissals, six... Uh, Five of them, well, six in strange circumstances, five of them to to their worst bowlers. And, and also, there's, there's a point in the Crawley innings where Australia, this is an absurd comparison, but I'm still going for it, reminds me of Smith, is that the bowlers don't know what to do, and then they suddenly go, do we bowl straight? And then he's so good at clipping balls on four, fifth That's stump. his shot, not the, the cover drive. Exactly. Think totally. cover drive. But, but, but it's, it's, it's the same line that you think you should be bowling to him because mm. that's where he nicks off so often. It's actually when, when, he's, when he gets going, he tries to flick that through mid-wicket. And then at that point, you're kind of like, I actually don't know where to bowl at him now. Yeah. I think um, there was another time after after another of the inside edges where they, they put like two mid-wickets in pretty much. And, and he bisected them. them. Yeah. <laughs> or as uh, Sanger said, dissected Sorry. them. <laughs> <laughs> and, he did and, that as well later. But <laughs> um, it's, it's, I just want to just want to say, if he is interested, and he might not be, and if he, if he isn't, fair fucks to him. But if, he's, if he wants to become a next level opening batter at test level, then hopefully what he's, what he's done here, first he gives him that foundation, but also... 
if you can recognize that there's certain times when the odds are against you, when the ball is swinging, under iffy conditions, whatever. Opening batsmen all through their lives, all through history, have tried to get bowlers to bowl at them. And if you're, if you're useful enough, you can make runs. He's not just useful through mid-wicket. He's gifted through mid-wicket. Short, full, on the pads, on off stump. He'll take you through there all day long. Mm. If he can marry that natural ability up with a slightly better judgment, only slightly, if it's, if it's long and full and it's not swinging, then throw your hands at it, fine. But if he can marry that up, if he can improve by a few percent his judgment calls, you know, the, the, the marsh wicket where he just thought it was there to drive and it ends up taking the stickers yeah. to be caught behind. Just don't drive that, Zachary. <laughs> yeah. Don't drive that. We're not going to judge you if you don't. You're not going to get dropped he, if you he, don't drive. He's eh? my uh, he's my favourite player to watch warm up because he he warms up literally by just pummeling full Whacking tosses it. into the yeah. net, and he's, no one has ever looked better. By the he's way, he's also my favourite player to watch run between the wickets because he makes he makes twos out of one and a half mm. all the time. He is so good at that. I I, I think what I, what I hope we're seeing is Crawley's graduation from one stage to the next. So we got you great players. He's definitely not one of them. You've got you great <laughs> players of great innings. He's probably not done that often enough yet to actually mm. be considered one. He's, but he is a player of great shots. And I wonder whether we're just about to see him go from shots to innings. Mm. Um, we can that, that would be great. We can guarantee seven and one at yeah. the Oval and, you know, shake hands on, on a that. pitch that's perfectly suited to on him. On a pitch that's perfectly suited. <laughs> Cummins gets him twice. A, ner yeah. a nervous seven <laughs> but, and but, an even but, less nervy one. But chopped on and caught mid-wicket. Yeah. yeah. Um, Shrugged his yeah. shoulders, walks off. Um, I know this has been really, really long. One final question. Uh, why can't the Ashes happen more often? Genuinely. Um, we, we, we talk about uh, there not being enough context. And I'm like, why do we have to wait four years? None of the, we, did, we talked about how very few of these guys are going to be around in four years' time. The Ashes in Australia uh, is a non-contest nine times Do you remember 2013? It is, would be my answer. Do, do you remember when we went back to back? We had 10 I, tests I, in I, I, about know, seven months. I still, months. I still <laughs> have that. I still have that. I would say the difference is that back then, 10 years ago, 10 long years ago, there were other teams that were up for playing. Yeah. If we are accepting that this game contracts mm. and contracts, then we get to a point where this becomes a very relevant question. Uh, and if we want Test cricket to continue to bounce along and it's, it's still to be relevant, mm. then perhaps in time, we'll be desperate for that. It became very fashionable to say, oh, there's a load of other cricket going on as well, you know. <laughs> Why do we have to obsess over the ashes? Well, there's a reason for that. And that will become all the more pronounced, I think, over the next few years. Mm. But, well, okay, what, what we... This is in this imperfect world. What we should be advocating for is a world where revenues are distributed more equitably and other countries are encouraged to, to, to play test cricket and to develop players. That means that the Ashes isn't the only cricket that's, that's good, basically. Mm. Like, like you got during the, during the 90s and the early 2000s, right? When, when, it, when England beat South Africa, I mean, I wasn't you know, really conscious for it, but when they beat South Africa in that five test series in, what, 98? That, that, that was a mm. proper... That, that was it. That, Absolutely fluke. Sure, it. but that, that felt like a proper event. Not quite Ashes level, because what is, but like if you can get the competitiveness of other cricket in England to be at that level, then mm. you don't need Ashes so much. That, that's what's depressing about looking at the possibility of what next year might bring, is that these teams who, you know, Sri Lanka have got actually have done good things in England in the past. You know, there was, they went for quite a long time. You know, West Indies generally beat us away. And it feels like even in the time since that West Indies tour even that things have changed to now make that look like a pretty a, a pretty slim su summer I suppose mm. yeah also, I, I just, got Australia I just five ODIs next summer as well I think I think things have changed quite quickly though and um, not necessarily are they are they died in the wool now uh you know with a change of priorities and philosophy at the top of the game then perhaps we may yet see a resurgence in certain depressed areas where once the test game was really valued and prioritized and now it's been shifted to one side i'm not saying it's all done and dusted by any means but mm. as things stand the direction suggests that these these series which we can be quite complacent about they become all the more all, all the more relevant if we want the game to continue so um, would you be up for ashes every 18 months yes uh yeah so 20, yeah. 24 25 and he, then he wants a return series 26. in october yeah running through bring, to january bring, bring it on scrap the world cup yeah um just to finish a little bit of um, podmin, um, we've got we've got a don't ever do that again. <laughs> we've got a uh, preview show for the fifth test what? coming up in two days time. I'm not on that. Which was a really really good idea when we thought it'd be two two going into the last test match. But we're going to use that op that show uh, as an opportunity to look back uh, at all the other stuff 
that's happened in cricket in the last week, including, by yes, the way, win. if the World Test Championship is what England focus on from now on. There is a massive final day currently uh, in Trinidad between India and West Indies, where if you think... If India are going to qualify for that World Test Championship final, they're probably going to need to win series like this 2-0. And going into the final day, they need eight West Indies wickets. And uh, there's a bit of weather about. So who knows? That could be a massive day for England in two years' time if Huge. we get that final. Also, um, Pakistan bazballing it in Colombo, scoring it, scoring it, run a ball. Uh, going to smash them. So it's, you know, there's lo- lots of green shoots. <laughs> yeah, well, we've, we've got an hour on Wednesday to, to get stuck into all that. Um, anyway, that is all for today. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Ben. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. We'll be back in two days' time. Hi, I'm Kumar Sangakara, and I'm speaking to you from the Kia Oval. Hello to all parents of young cricket fans. If you are 11 to 16 years old, or if you are a parent of an 11 to 16-year-old, then this message is for you. As part of the partnership between Surrey County Cricket Club and Kia, this amazing opportunity has been created to motivate and excite you, cricket's next generation. This is your chance as a young cricketer to play here on the hallowed green of the Kia Oval where I spent some great years playing for Surrey in the sport that I love so much. You could be here at a coaching session with me on Saturday, September the 23rd before playing out there on the field, courtesy of Kia, who have sponsored this club and ground for over a decade. Cricket has been a huge part of my life since I was a little boy, from the age of about 11 or 12, and I know what an opportunity like this would have meant to me. If you want the chance to be part of this, all you need to do is apply, and we might see each other in September.